Hello, my name is Nancy Nolan Jones, and I am an oral historian working with the Reflections of Black Life in Cleveland collection. Today is August the 2nd, 2019. We are here with Dick Peary to do an interview um, that will kind of give us more background on his life and the life of Cleveland. Okay, so good morning. Ah, hello. Dick, thank you so much for coming. Um, for the record, we'd like to have your full name and birth date and where you were born. My name is Richard Peary. I was born June 12, 1934 in Walbishaw, Minnesota. Oh. I'm sure everybody knows where that is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think I know where that is, but it is one of those small towns that we were talking about earlier? Yeah, it, it was, yeah, it, it's, uh, I guess you call it small, a population of about 2,500 people. And my father was a railway mail clerk, and somehow he got assigned to that town by the post office. So uh, we were living, well, the family was living there when, when I was born. We didn't, I, we moved away when I was two years old, so I have no recollection of it. Wabashaw, okay. although I heard stories about it all the time I was growing up. Uh, but for anyone who's interested, if you ever see the movie Grumpy Old Man with Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau, that was set in Wabashaw. No kidding. So, yeah. And uh, I guess one of the interesting things about it was while we lived there, we were the only black family in the town. And uh, I guess for many decades we were the only black family that, leave, that lived there even you know, long after we were gone. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I say, I, I personally I know little about that because I grew up in Minneapolis. Right. Tell me, tell me about your dad and your, your mother and even your grandparents. Where did your parents, where were they born? Uh, my well, my, my grandparent, my grandfather's, uh, my father's father, well, I, you know, he was born, I guess, in Missouri. I think both of my grandfathers were born in Missouri. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, my father's father lived in St. Joseph, Missouri. That's where my father grew up. My mother, on the other hand, uh, lived throughout Kansas and Missouri if, for reasons I'm not clear on. Uh, her mother moved around from to a number of cities or uh, towns. Her father, her, her parents didn't stay married. Her father, I think, remained in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. And my mother was actually born in Kansas, a little town called Oswego, Kansas. She uh, was born in 1894, so she remembers from when she was a four-year-old. She was They were living in Junction City at Fort Riley. She remembers talk of the soldiers being shipped out to the Spanish-American War. And uh, she went on to attend uh, college, uh, well she, she graduated from high school in Kansas City, Kansas and went to a two-year teacher's college in Des Moines, Iowa. And then uh, she taught in for a year or two in Mound Bayou, Mississippi, a thriving all-black town in the Mississippi Delta at that time. And uh, she taught also in for a year in Albany, Georgia, uh, she was she worked for the American Missionary Society, mm. and then she and her mother were living in St. Joseph when she met my father's family, and mm. they got married. They had their first two children there. But my father, incidentally, was a veteran of World War One. Ah. He was in intense combat. And remind me where St. Joseph was again. St. Joseph, Missouri. Missouri, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you, uh, so, uh, in any case, they got married. My two oldest brothers were born there. And when my father came out of 
the military, he wound up uh, with a job as a railway mail clerk and wanted to get out of the South, and so that's how he got transferred to Minnesota. Ah. And uh, one thing they kept doing, they kept having children, so they finally stopped with me at number seven. Yeah. <laughs> so I came from a fairly large family, and of course on a meal clerk's salary, we didn't have much money, so I asked my mother one day, why don't I have a sister? And she said, they cost too much money. So we were just seven boys. <laughs> seven boys, mm -hmm. and you're the seventh. I'm the seventh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> and the girls cost too much money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's cute enough. So, of course, your mom was a homemaker. She stayed home raising yeah, the family. Yeah, mostly she stayed at home, yeah. After, uh, by the time I came along, of course, sir. she had plenty to do at home. <laughs> I would say so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so then you you mentioned that you moved away um, from from Wabasha. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. It, when you were two, where did you migrate to at that well, point? Well, the family then moved to Minnesota, to uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and that's where we stayed until I was grown. Okay, so you grew up in Minneapolis. I grew up. Yeah, all of my childhood memories are in Minneapolis. Yes. Tell us about those memories. How how did the family unit um, with seven boys. Did you go to church? Who was the disciplinarian in the family? Well, a lot of people, I think some of the neighbors said we were undisciplined, so I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we, uh, well, it's a funny thing you ask about church. We weren't really much of a church-going family, but in Wabashaw, as I understand it, there were only two churches and one was Catholic and one was Episcopal. And we weren't Catholic, so uh, family was going to an Episcopal church there. And then when we moved to Minneapolis, there was a, the one black Episcopal church uh, in the city. And so I attended there, attended that when I was really very young. Mm -hmm. But we weren't uh, regular church going family. Yeah. did then attend the AME church for a time too, mm -hmm. but uh, got kind of a broad view of the did, various religions. Did you have big family dinners on Sunday like you hear different people speak of in the South? Then because Minnesota living is quite different from Georgia or Alabama, so. Yes, the, the uh, I think one of the tragic losses uh, that we've experienced as a people over in recent decades is we no longer have the family sitting down at the table on a regular basis. But yes, we ate every meal when I was small, every meal seven days a week at the big dining room table, the whole family ate at the same time and all that. And looking back on it, it was a very important time for me just to hear everybody else talking and, and uh, hearing the kind of conversations that I don't think my children got enough of and other children don't because you either are not eating together or you're eating in front of the TV or something else. Right, we lost that. So yes, because that was a time where you could catch up and update mm -hmm. on what everybody else was doing. And yeah, and we learned what we're supposed to do <laughs> at the dinner table. Right. Right. And uh, so, yeah, I grew up, uh, as I say, in Minneapolis, in the schools, uh, there never was a, I never attended a school or a classroom with a black majority. They were, we were always a minority all through school. Uh, and in fact, in Minneapolis at that time, they did not hire black teachers, they refused to do so. So all of my teachers were white all through school. In fact, that practice was only broken up, uh, I think it was about 1947 or 48 when the Cold War was heating up. And the local Communist Party uh, members picketed or passed out leaflets at a school board meeting attacking the school board for racial discrimination because they refused to hire Negro teachers. 
and of course the superintendent and the school board president and everyone said oh, that's simply not true and those are communist lies and really trashed the people who passed out the leaflets and they proved that they were wrong by going out and hiring the first black teacher. Wow. And that was in 19... That was about 1948 or 49. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Incidentally, the library's uh, board was elected separately, a separate body, and uh, they had never hired a black person, but when they saw what happened with the school board, they rushed out and hired a black clerk, right away. a young lady who then spent the rest of her life working there until she retired. Isn't it interesting? So the Brown versus Board of Education um, ruling really applied to the South in terms of student population mm -hmm. and then affirmative action which was not called at that time in 48 but that was what helped to integrate the faculty well i don't uh, of course that came along after the time i'm sure. talking about but i after world war ii uh, things started opening up in the north generally and uh so it was only, you know, in the next few years, you had met a lot of black teachers. They were pouring in after the war, and the veterans were getting their college education. Many of them went into education, and they could get jobs in. Mm -hmm. uh, I, of course, I left the town uh, in the 50s. I don't know what impact Brown versus Board of Education had in Minneapolis. But it certainly did make a difference generally in the North where there was the discrimination and they, they had to stop or change their way of discriminating. At right. Least. right. Mm -hmm. So you went all the way through 12th grade? Yeah. I, I, went, uh, I went through 12th grade and then I uh, attended for a time, I attended the University of Minnesota. Uh, and but I moved away uh, after a couple of years. I uh, the family then was uh, moving all over the country. I was the youngest, so my older brothers were had moved out, and one of my brothers was living in uh, Detroit, and he asked me, urged me to come to Detroit. And so I went there, and I lived there for about a year. It was a great experience. And then another brother who had settled in Cleveland, uh, I came down to visit him and somehow I wound up, I happened to get a job and so I didn't go back to Detroit and I, I'd never considered myself a Clevelander until one day I woke up and I said, I'm married, I'm a father, I'm working, I guess I'm a Clevelander now. <laughs> been <laughs> a I've while. Been huh? Yeah. <laughs> so I've been here for about the last 60 years. Isn't that something? So where did you first work when you got to Cleveland? I uh, took a variety of jobs. I was a, um, oh, well let me backtrack and uh, while I was in high school, yeah, I get summer jobs as a waiter on railroads. That was a great experience for a single guy. <laughs> uh, so for a few summers I did that. I would travel between Chicago and Seattle and uh, on the dining cars and have a few hours in town and got to see a lot of the north that way. In fact, it was uh, really eye-opening for me because, as I said, we're from this large family we could never afford a vacation anywhere. So uh, I never left the state of Minnesota until I got a job on the railroad. Nice. And so then I came to, uh, in both Detroit and Cleveland, I worked in hotels and clubs and things. And uh, so that, that was what I did. And then I started going, I returned to college at uh, Western Reserve not Case Western Reserve because they were separate back then. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I went to school intermittently and worked after I got here. Working on the railroad was quite the thing. Um, mm -hmm. Pullman porters. I was hearing somebody reference Pullman porters even and how that union came about to mm -hmm. help um, 
improve conditions for everybody probably across the board. But I think being able to travel yes. is uh, how people appreciate air travel. Well, train travel was the way to go at that point. Yeah, yeah, you had to travel by train or by bus, one or the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, the passenger trains were full and uh, it was funny, most jobs on railroads back then, uh, black people were barred from. You know, there were no black engineers, brakemen, firemen, and all these other jobs. And the only jobs that black people could get with railroads back then were uh, dining car waiters, which I was, or Pullman porters who worked in the sleeping cars. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were considered really good jobs, and people who had those jobs were very often the uh, pillars in their black neighborhoods back home mm -hmm. because they had steady incomes and and they were looked up to and many many of the uh, political and business leaders of the last 40 years 50 years had done those kinds of jobs mm -hmm. to get started they were really kind of an underpinning. The railroad jobs and the uh, post office really held the black community together economically. Right. In fact, and I say I worked as a waiter, uh, another dining car waiter uh, whom I, I never worked on a crew with him, but I saw him in the commissary and we got to know each other, was a law student Carl Stokes up in Minnesota. And that's where I first met him. Huh. And uh, then when I moved to Detroit, I remember working in a hotel one day serving a banquet and we're sitting around, uh, of course, waiting for whatever we had to wait for before we went to work. And I got to know, had a nice conversation with another waiter there who actually wound up giving me a ride home in his car. That was Coleman Young, who was later the mayor of Detroit for 20 years. Right. And I guess those kinds of stories weren't uncommon from that period. Right. But uh, almost everybody you talked to who was in the professions later on could maybe tell you the time they worked on uh, in a hotel or in a dining car. Interesting, interesting, yes. very mm -hmm. interesting. So as you um, migrated to Cleveland, we'll just kind of get to the you know, move along in, in the trajectory of your life. Um, you met your wife no. in Cleveland? I met my wife in Cleveland. Um, that, that was uh, kind of funny. As I said, I had a, a brother here whose wife knew uh, this young lady and told me I, that she wanted us to meet. We seemed to, to have a lot in common. And that was the last thing I wanted was to <laughs> some arrange some blind date. I was enjoying my bachelorhood and all. And uh, so actually she tried for about two years to get us together and we never, we, we always were busy. She, apparently this young lady had better things to do than meet this woman's brother-in-law. <laughs> and so finally, after a couple of years, she forced us to meet and neither of us was very impressed with the other but having nothing better to do we started going to a movies together or something and and after a few months we were married <laughs> wow. and we stayed that way for 50 years isn't that they don't make them like that anymore well yeah so uh, I guess the moral of that is stay away from arranged dates unless you want to spend the next 50 years together. <laughs> well, or become friends first. Yeah, well, we, we, uh, yeah, we became friends pretty quickly. We did find we had a lot in common and we figured why wait around. <laughs> and so you had how many children? We had uh, two daughters. Then. Two daughters, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and I, I do know one of your daughters, very lovely person. Well, thank you. Yes, very lovely My person. wife, by the way, uh, she passed away uh, after 50 years of marriage, so 
down or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I I did not hear about that until after the effect, or you would have seen me, you know, there at the services, and so my condolences for that. I'm sure that's a huge adjustment in your life that you're still navigating. Well, I'll tell you about that. Uh, um, she developed Alzheimer's, ah. which I always say was a real... I mean, if I want to, if I can joke about this stuff, it was, uh, it really took me for a loop because she was younger than I was and I always assumed I got someone to take care of me in my old age. Yeah. Well, but it was, even though she was younger than I, I wound up taking care of her for the last seven years of her life and uh, people have said to me, oh, gee, that must have been hard and that was a real adjustment and I tell them, no, that was the only time in my life, I think, where I had no misgivings or questions or doubts about what I was doing. I knew what, what had to be done and I did it and it was, while it was sad in many ways, it also was clear mm -hmm. what my purpose was and so sure. in that sense it, it was a, it wasn't as bad as it sounds. Sure. The loss was bad, but the duty was not hard to fulfill. Sure. And it, it was kind of a long goodbye, yeah. so it wasn't sudden. Yes, that, yeah, you talked about making adjustments. Yeah, knowing the course for over the years where, where we were headed, uh, there was a, adjustments going on, psychological adjustments all along, so mm -hmm. when it finally happened, you knew it was time. Yeah, you know it's time. Yeah. Godspeed.